Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You know, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart of man believeth in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. I'm so glad I remember the exact day I asked Jesus in my heart to be my personal Savior and, and, and confessed him as Lord of my life. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 tells us that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And I'm saved, for I confess Jesus as Lord. And at the point of salvation, I receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to need that Holy Spirit to help me teach today. To this end, I believe the Lord wanted me to share this brief testimony. Because, you know, we should never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and I'm not. Romans 10, 32 and 33, Jesus said, Whosoever there shall confess me before men, I shall confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denieth me before men, I shall deny before my Father which is in heaven. Today's lesson is the Trinity. Let's begin in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I do give you praise and glory and honor. And I pray you fill me with the Holy Spirit so I can be a good teacher for you today. I pray that um, your name will be glorified, somebody will be blessed, and we can learn the Word of God together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I, I'm going to use a lot of scriptures, but this is a Bible study, so that's probably no need to apologize for that. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Is the word Trinity actually found in the Bible? No, it isn't. However, we use the word Trinity because it describes three persons in one essence. By this, we do not mean that we worship three gods. We worship only one God, but he reveals himself in three distinct persons, known respectively as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That seems to be a difficult song concept to believe. Three people, yet there are only one God. How could you explain this truth to unbelievers? I once illustrated to my Sunday school class in a feeble kind of way. Say you got an egg, you got the shell of the egg, the white of the egg, the yellow of the egg, three parts of the egg, you got one egg. You got an apple, the skin of the apple, the white of the apple, the seeds of the apple, three parts of the apple, you got one apple. You got God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three parts of God, but one personality, one God. There is no question that the teaching of the Trinity is a mystery, and many people have a difficult time believing what no man can explain, but it is nonetheless the teaching of the Word of God. How can you accept something you can't explain? Many say, well, if it can, can be explained in facts that I can see and understand, then I just can't accept it as being true. But what's faith anyhow? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For the he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is believing without seeing, and it takes faith to accept biblical truth, even though it can't be explained. Just ponder a second. Can anyone here explain the force we call gravity? Man cannot explain that force, so he's just given it a name. Now, when we see objects fall, we simply say, oh, that's gravity. But does that explain gravity? Can anyone here explain the wind? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Go to John 3.8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. You can hear, feel, and see the effects of the wind, but can you explain it? Likewise, can you explain how it is to be born again of the Spirit? Other examples of things that we accept today without explanation are the conception of a child, electricity, and animal instincts. Just to mention a few, it's a strange that man accepts so much, yet when he comes to the nature and the ability of God, he rejects them because he cannot completely explain it. 
rehash the question that was brought about earlier in the lesson so far. If you could understand everything about God, what kind of God would he be? A man must come to the point at which he realizes that his own wisdom is really stupidity and foolishness with God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 through 27. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's why me, being a nothing, can stand before this pulpit before you right now. But I'm sure that God must often laugh at the great accomplishments of man. It's like a child running to show his father a great new discovery that water actually comes out of the ground, not out of pipes. The father, of course, knew this all along and probably said things to himself. My, it certainly took him a long time to figure that one out. That is what, what, the way it is with God. He has tried to explain to us his most simple terms, what he is like. But our minds are so small, we cannot even begin to comprehend his nature. It was like a couple weeks ago, I was cutting the grass out there and, and the, with the small lawnmower, and the wheel came off. And I'm not really mechanically inclined, and I almost panicked in that. But I thought it out, I got pliers, I found all the parts, and I put the wheel back together. I said, wow, what a great accomplishment. <laughs> but, but if that was Brother Dave still looking at me, you would say, well, it took a long time for him to figure that one out. But... <laughs> If we could figure out God, he, wasn't much, he wouldn't be much of a God anyhow, would he? To this end, we can offer proof that there is a holy trinity, whether we can fully understand it or not. Let's see how the Bible constantly associates the three persons of the Godhead in their work. First of all, all the three persons of the trinity are mentioned in the baptism of Jesus. Go to Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And a low a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So how was God the Father present? A voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So how was Jesus pre present, coming straight weight out of the water? How was the Holy Spirit present, descending like a dove and lighting upon Jesus? Can you um, remember another occasion in the Bible in which the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm sure many of your Bible scholars out there can, but for everybody's sake, including mine, let's go to Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a, a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, 
this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. So the transfiguration also marked a second time in which God the Father glorified God the Son with a voice from heaven. Now let's look at the Great Commission. We're still in Matthew, go Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The great, in the Great Commission, Jesus commanded the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, which once again associates the three together in their work. The Apostle Paul blessed the church by including each person of the Trinity. Go to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Just one verse here. It's the last verse in 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. All three persons of the Trinity present. And all, also all three persons of the Trinity are united together at salvation. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit and to the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. If you're saved, you're the elect, and God the Father knew what happened, and when you're saved, God puts his blood upon the doorposts of your heart, and God the Holy Spirit sanctifies you, sets you apart as holy. Once again, all three persons of the Godhead associated together. Later in the lesson, we'll study more how the Trinity is evolved in salvation. However, next, we can also see the influence of every member of the Trinity in Christ's birth. Go to John 3.16, even though I know everybody here knows it like the back of their hand. We'll read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that for whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God the Father sent God the Son to earth, and God the Son became flesh. Let's look where he became flesh. Go back two chapters to John 1.14. And the world, word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he beheld his glory, the glory of the, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now let's look where the God, the Holy Spirit, plays into this three-way scenario. Go uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35. I shared this verse uh, last time I taught, but we're doing it in a different capacity today. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. Here once again, all three persons of the Trinity are seen to act separately, yet in a unifying manner. All three persons of the Trinity are united when we pray. Go to Ephesians 5.20.
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse tells us to pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ. But whose power do we pray? Go to Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit gives us power to pray for us what we ought. Here again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all united together when we pray. Let's see how the Holy Spirit ties the Trinity together. Go to 1 John chapter 4, 12 through 15. It's, it's heading towards Revelation. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. 1 John 4, 12 through 15. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and the lo his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we know, and uh, you don't have to go there, John 14, 20, it says, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit dwell within the born-again believer. And it's the Holy Spirit that confirms this. Romans eight sixteen says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Trinity tied together once again. Now let's look at the enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, which helps us to understand the Trinity. Go to John 14, 26. Jesus speaking in the red letter, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring thing, all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So God, the Spirit, will enable us to understand God's word, which conveys the mind of God. Go one more chapter up, John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So God the Spirit testifies of God the Son. Once again, the Trinity is associated together. God the Spirit tells us the mind of God the Father and testifies of God the Son. Okay, let's see now how Peter preached the Trinity on the day of Pentecost. Go one more book up and to Acts 2, 32, 33. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Here Peter draws a clear distinction between the Son at that moment exalted and seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, and the Father himself, at whose right hand the Son 
Christ Jesus is now seated. An equally clear distinction is drawn between the Son exalted and the Holy Ghost whom the Son received from the Father and shed upon the believers as the cloven tongues of fire. Again, the Trinity grouped together as Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. In addition, the Trinity was present as Stephen was being stoned. Let's go a little bit further in Acts, Acts 7, 55 and 56. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So how was God the Father pres present? He was glorified in heaven. How was God the Son present, standing on God the Father's right hand? And how was the Spirit present, filling Stephen as he was full of the Holy Ghost? Trinity, once again, associated together. Let's change gears a little bit and see how all three persons of the Trinity have an eternal existence. Go to Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So God the Father has eternal existence. Go to John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ was the Word, therefore God the Son has an eternal existence. And now, let's go to Hebrews 9.14 to check on the Holy Spirit. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This verse tells us God the Spirit has the eternal existence, henceforth grouping the Trinity together once again. Let's look at how creation proves the Trinity. Go to Genesis 126. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This verse conveys that God is more than one, doesn't it? According to the use of the pronouns us and our. Let's view how the pronouns us and our indicate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Go just a little bit back, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God the Father was definitely involved in creation. Go one more verse down, Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So God the Spirit aided in creation. 
Now, let's uh, go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. God the Son gets the most verses here. giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So we see God the Son also created all things. John 1, 3 also confirms that Jesus created all things. It says all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Once again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all involved in creation. Let's a little, look a little more now how the Trinity is involved in salvation. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in the last times for you. So God the Father is the originator of salvation and that he has ordained Christ before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 tells us that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which further solidifies the Father as the originator of salvation. Secondly, God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the instrument through which salvation is made available to man. Christ's sacrifice of himself makes the reconciliation possible. Jesus, first of all, is our ransom. Go to Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Secondly, Jesus is our reconciliation. Go to Romans 5.10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay, and Jesus is also our substitution. Go over to 1 Peter 2.24. who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Yes, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. So God the Son 
is the instrument through which salvation is made available to man. Thirdly, God the Spirit is the agent by which we are born again. Go to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the Holy Spirit is the agent which pricks and prods and tugs on somebody's heart's door that he need to be saved. It convicts the heart of sin. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all take part in salvation. In John 6, 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which sent him, you know, draw him and I'll rise him up at the last day. It's God, the Father draws you to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Next lesson, we'll be studying the Holy Spirit in greater detail and we'll discover more information how the Holy Spirit's involved in a person's salvation. But now, let's look how each person in the Trinity seals our salvation. Amen for eternal security. John 6.27, please. Labor not for the meat which perish, but for the meat which endureth into everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So God the Father seals our salvation. Now go over to Ephesians 1.13. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So God, the Holy Spirit, seals our salvation. We're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Also, in Ephesians 4, 30 affirms this truth, saying, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Yes, we're sealed into the day of redemption by God, the Holy Spirit. Go to 2 Timothy 2.19, please. No, uh, yeah, sorry. 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand as sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So God the Son seals our salvation. Wow, think about it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all seal our salvation. In addition, all three persons of the Trinity keep our salvation. We're in 2 Timothy, so just go back a chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. For this which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy boldly declared that God the Son keeps his salvation. Go one more verse, 2 Timothy 1.14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, kept by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Here Paul expounds that God, the Holy Spirit, which dwelleth in us, keeps our salvation. And now go over to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Here the apostle Peter declares that our salvation is kept by the power of God the Father. Once again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all keep our salvation. Hallelujah. Blessed assurance for our eternal security provided by the Trinity. Last but not least, let's look how each person of the Trinity is present at the rapture. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we shall live and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So how is God the Father present at the rapture? With the trump of God. The trumpet in the Bible was used for worship, warnings, warfare, work, and walk. In addition, the trumpet was used as a symbol of victory, such as in the fall of Jericho. Let's look at that real quick. Joshua 6.20, the sixth book of the Old Testament. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Likewise, at the rapture, the trump of God will announce our victory over death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How is God the Son present at the rapture, descending from heaven with a shout? A shout is a common cry by which a signal is given to men. Remember when Jesus cried with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost at Calvary? Go to Matthew 27, 50 through 52. We're almost done. I know there's a lot of scripture here today. <laughs> Matthew 27, 50 through 52. I can't go wrong with scripture, that's for sure. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Likewise, when Jesus shouts at the time of the rapture, a much larger number of bodies of the saints will rise from the grave, won't they? So how is God, the Holy Spirit, presented the rapture? The last scripture we're going to uh, read together and the Holy Spirit, which will change your body into a glorified, resurrected body like Jesus' is Romans 8.11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, 
He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The word quicken means to revive, to show life. So God, the Holy Spirit, which raised Jesus from the dead, will also change our bodies at the time of the rapture. We'll be given a glorified, resurrected body, fashioned into the glorified, resurrected body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. will be an incorruptible body, never to decay, grow old, or have pain or sickness. it will be an immortal body, never have to die again. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all pr present at the time of the rapture. In conclusion, the word Trinity is not actually found in the Bible. However, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are always associated together in their work. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. I hope this study has given us a better understanding of the Trinity today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I do give you praise and glory and honor. I thank you for helping me put all this together and that, and, uh, and I feel you did guide my hand when I wrote these, uh, this together, this lesson, and I thank you because I can't do it without the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray somebody was blessed and that your name was glorified by it all, and I pray we learn together more about the Trinity. And I thank you, Lord, too, for the participators and the volunteers in, in the bike a thon yesterday and also those ones that um, I pray that the Baptist kids will be blessed from the whole thing and I pray for Pastor Bob put a hedge of protection about him as he gives his message so Satan will not distract him and open the hearts and the minds of people what the word of God says and I pray that that Holy Spirit will prick and prod and tug on somebody's heart story this very day to be saved I pray in the precious name of Jesus Amen